What's up? Silas here. So some thoughts about humans. We have biologically developed brains that enable our ability to evolve and adjust to the world in ways that are not explicitly physical. So that's kind of, we don't have to evolve a better eye because we can use binoculars to see further. We don't need a louder voice because we can have a loudspeaker. You know, we don't need tougher skin because we can have like Kevlar or we don't need skin that's more waterproof because we can create raincoats. So these are things that our species developed and I think are considered part of our evolutionary pro process. So with questions like what is the highest flying animal, the deepest diving animal, the fastest one, the strongest animal, the longest living animal, I would argue that the answers to all these questions can be humans. So to defend this, why do we consider an anthill or different kinds of anthills to be part of that animal's evolution, evolution or evolutionary process, but we don't consider things like skyscrapers to be part of humans' evolutionary process? I mean, if you take a termite and you take an ant and they have different kinds of hills or different kinds of living, <laughs> living abodes, places they live, you wouldn't say that is separate from them. You wouldn't say that is an unnatural part of ants, unnatural parts of termites. But you'd say, yes, this is part of their evolution. This is something they have naturally evolved as they grew. And I think that should apply to skyscrapers. That should apply to the internet. That should apply to vehicles and apply to things that humans create. Some of you may be aware of what RK selection strategy of reproduction is. I suggest you look more into it, but I'll give you a quick overview of how I understand it. So R selection is a strategy that goes with quantity over quality. So this is focusing on a higher rate of reproduction and a lower investment in raising those children. Now with K selection, it's the opposite of this, and that's going for quality over quantity. So this is fewer kids at a lower rate of reproduction with higher investment in those fewer children. So part of what, part of what uh, led me to actually create this video and um, want to make this video is I saw this rather interesting critique of people that use and discuss RK, RK strategy by Kraut and T, which was titled, The Alt-Right is Too Dumb for Sex. So I'll leave links below to that. Um, he, had, he had mentioned two people that I have mentioned before in videos and have inspired me to both create these videos and help me think through a lot of things, which is um, Bill Whittle and Stefan Molyneux. And they're some of the first places I heard of RK strategy from. So I think it's it's a it was a good video by Kraut and T. I mean, a little disclaimer that it's a bit vitriolic, but if you're familiar with RK strategy, I think it's good to kind of listen to this video by Kraut and T and I think it's good for these kind of ideas to have people to increase increase the discourse in it and kind of have people work out the ideas and work out what exactly this is to take it from just a theory or a hypothesis to an actual situation where you're like, oh, this actually works in this way. So kind of the rest of this is my attempt to kind of parse through what I think might have been uh, some of the objections to the RK strategy that Kraut and T made and how I understand it and how I think it actually applies to human life. The core point that I think Kraut and T was trying to make was that humans as a whole, the human species, has biologically developed as a K species, with the primary evidence for that being the reproductive system of females, which is tailored for a relatively long gestation period of nine months at mostly one child at a time, with an advisable lengthy period of after the birth to breastfeed and care for the child. And that child themselves is not normally able to act to sufficiently fend for themselves for at least a couple of years after that. They have to have parental supervision for that time. So I do agree with that, that compared to most life forms, humans do have, humans in general are just a K species. We have a longer, higher investment requirement for raising children in an effective way. So it would make sense that, accounting for that, that humans have developed and... So accepting for that, it would make sense that humans have the ability to bestow upon our children the most beneficial and comfortable lifestyle on Earth compared to probably any other life form. We have the ability to live in the most places under some of the harshest conditions, and I think that's something that goes without too much argument. I mean, you can make some arguments with some things like there are these 
don't know, what are these things called? These like little bear creatures or something. They're these microscopic creatures that can apparently be frozen or can live in space. And then we found some things in the depths of these frozen little ponds or lakes in glaciers. But if that's quality of life for you, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm okay with living in cities and having access to modern technology. I think I'll take that over the ability to be frozen and come back to life, at least for now. So if a quality of life, having a quality of life is not something that's K, being able to have one child and ensure they live a better life than any other living creature in the world, in, in pretty much any environment, then I don't know what K is. So that being said, we also have the ability to be as R as any other being that has ever existed. A simple example that is not as malicious as some of them is a sperm bank. There is ability to have countless of children without knowing a single one of them. You know, even the most R species, whenever the seed is actually spread, for example, I think Kraut and T used a thistle as this example. The thistle just has a little little white kind of seeds tied to this little white poof thing that just floats off and spreads the seed everywhere. And, you know, like bees or other insects need to come to help the reproductive process. It's not a direct reproductive process. It's kind of literally just a spray and pray. Okay, without the pray, it's just kind of spray your seed out there and see what happens. So that's something a human can do, which if he's using that as a very typical R strategy, that's something a human can do. You can go to a sperm bank and just leave your sperm in there, and then that sperm can be spread apart, spread around the world. Now, another example that uses more force and thus is more immoral is something like Genghis Khan. You know, he was going around just copulating with women as he chooses and spreading his genetic material across vast ranges of people with very little investment in each particular child. So a little sidebar here is like race comes up here and that Asians are often considered a K species when people try to apply RK to different races. They say, okay, I think they say uh, Aborigines or Sub-Saharan Blacks are the lowest, Sub-Saharan Africans are the lowest. Then it goes to, I think, I guess like Arabs or something would be there, Latin people would be there, then it goes to whites, then it goes to Asians, and I think uh, Ashkenazi Jews or something like that. That's the general thing with race that's normally applied. And I think this is a good time as any to mention that I may have a general bias. You might say I might have a general bias in this, since as I mentioned there, I come from Sub-Saharan Africans, which is normally considered to be lower on the R, on a less, on a less uh, preferential, I'd say, position on the whole RK strategy thing. So coming from that position, make out, make of it what you may. But I think this gives you some pause to say that in all situations, even if they're saying this group of people that you're in are more of this trait, unless somebody specifically says all people in this group there are always exceptions to these things, and it doesn't define any per any particular individual. So, what would you conf also consider the um, aforementioned ants to be? And this is a little digression about like the neutral nuptial flight and its uh, place in the reproduction process of ants. I, I thought this was pretty cool. I just want to share this with you. So typically, the virgin queens and males first scatter to ensure outcrossing. I guess that's to ensure that there's different genetic patterns or whatever going through. And then the queens release pheromones to attract males. Then however, the queens the queens often try to escape the males, allowing only the fastest and fittest males to mate. So they catch the queen and then mate with them. So mating takes place during flight, and then one queen usually mates with several males. The sperm is stored in a special organ known as a spermathesa in the queen's abdomen and lasts throughout her lifetime. This can be as long as 20 years, during which time the sperm can be used to fertilize tens and millions of eggs, which is pretty amazing. I mean, it's just really amazing how much information there is out there. And I'm continually amazed about how much I'm still amazed despite being amazed for this so long. So yeah, so end of digression here. Um, so when you apply this RK theory to different cultures, this is what I see. If you compare humans to other animals, then yes, we are K across the board. Our physical cells have developed to pursue K strategies, and uh, we have selected for K contained, I mean, for traits that are contained in K genes. So, when you break that down to just human cultures, though, I would argue that the individuals within that specific culture that you're discussing that pursues the most K strategy within that given environment that developed that culture will be the most successful in that group. 
So K is adaptive. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. And a K strategy may express itself in a different way if you live in a desert versus if you live in a rainforest. Okay, I think a good example, a practical example for this would be, for example, you take an African tribe. Within that tribe, the most K individuals, the males that have a K strategy or have the most K genes, most K selected genes within that tribe would actually attract and gain access to the highest number of females and then reproduce with the highest number of these females. If you compare this to a monogamous relationship in a developed country, it may at first glance to seem like, okay, that Luya tribesman, because he has three wives and 12 kids from <laughs> each of the wives, that, that person is a far more R strategist than the person in, let's say, New York City, who has one wife and two kids. So in actuality, the tribesman may actually be able to invest more time into passing on his personal ideals, culture, and values to his children than the monogamous couple in New York City. And this couple in New York City might be focusing more on working and other social acceptance things and standing and maintaining position in the society that they live in and have very little actual substance of their personal values and ideals passed on to their two children have very little time face time in front of their kids where they're actually sitting there and talking and sharing and growing together. So they may leave those children with a comparatively low value of reproducing and importance of creating a family of their own. So I could develop this thought more and it's just a hypothesis if anything and I really see some issues with it since these parents in uh, New York, this, this example I'm using, they could actually be passing on their parenting. I mean, they could be passing on their personal values of state growth. They could be saying, we are pro-state, we are pro having a large state by passing on their parental responsibilities to the state. That could actually be how they pass on their personal values to their children, which would explain some of the protesting and support for socialism, communism, and other collectivist type ideas that are cropping up in the West. So, yeah, this is just a hypothesis, but I think some of this can be, you can see some of this happening now, which is interesting to kind of point out, is seeing people that were in a generation, like, for example, my grandparents' generation in Kenya, they were, polygamy was a much more accepted thing. Most, a lot of men had multiple wives in that situation, at least a decent amount. Now you have people who their kids moved to Nairobi, moved to the capital city, have moved from the villages to more urban areas, and this has changed the culture, this has changed the environment, this has changed the access to resources. So I think the RK strategies now are being applied to a different kind of reality. And those um, families, those kids from these people have now adapted to a more monogamous type of uh, family structure. So again, another thing to add with the cities, with these sub-Saharan African cities, at least from my experience, a lot of the families in the middle class and even the lower class, I mean, just a lot of the families, a lot of these people that may have switched from um, polygamous situation and switching into a monogamous situation still tend to have house help. So it's not necessarily they're just completely spending as much time with the parenting. They still find themselves out working more. But yeah, this is something that I'm working on. And I think I'll touch on this topic again. So now back to the actual topic. So I'll use another example, I think, of uh, language. Instead of using RK reproduction, reproductive strategy, let's say there was an RK thing applied to language where humans are the most capable of speaking or communicating than all other animals. So there's no need to even mention the internet or the way I'm communicating to you in this video or the audio that you're listening to. But that's like all sorts of just, I mean, just think about that. We're just talking about being amazed, but just think about the amazing natural human wizardry that goes through doing uh, what's happening right now in this communication, this interaction. So, but just think about the ability of speaking itself, even just speaking in different languages. So I think we're the best at communicating and communicate past our own actual lives. Like I can communicate into the future. I've communicated, I've heard ideas from people in the past. Um, we are able to communicate to people we'll never meet. For example, I'm probably not going to meet most of the people that I'm speaking to here that are listening to this. Um, we are able to 
even communicate across different species like we can kind of try to communicate to dogs and other creatures and kind of try to learn how they talk and then we can do that to them but i don't think hum- i mean all those creatures can do it anywhere close to the same level that we can um and we're even able to communicate from entirely created or imaginary situations you know just make metaphors or write books or create art or just do these different things so yeah we're we're awesome <laughs> go team human we're awesome at communicating i think if there was an rk of communication more effective we'd say humans would be at the top if you compare them to all other humans you can just say humans have developed to be a literal species i don't think many people would argue against that so this would not be entirely accurate though since some of us do not speak or we have different communication levels. So one would compare literacy levels of individuals within human cultures, or at least the human species. You know, I would not want to include a tree when I'm saying like, okay, where do humans stand on communication strategies? Like, no, the trees are an entirely different thing, yet trees might communicate to other trees in another way, just how plants plants reproduce compared to other plants in another way. I'd keep that together, I'd keep ants together, I'd keep the way, or maybe you could keep mammals together, you can keep insects together, but when you go and communicate the strategies and apply R to K across the board, I think that's possibly a little disingenuous or doesn't really, it's not really how I work with RK strategy. So back to the communication thing. So when you apply this to groups, for example, if you take a group of people from Shanghai, China, within that group, there will be people that are far more literal than others. You take the most literal person from that group and you place them in Kakamega, Kenya, and they may be considered illiterate. If they carried out the same exact communicative strategy that made them the most literate person in Shanghai, they may be less communicative than your average Kakamegan two-year-old in quality versus, I mean, in quantity versus uh, quality of words. You know, they might have entire Chinese language, entire Mandarin Chinese, but still, a Kakamegan able to speak, a two-year-old Kakamegan able to speak maybe 20 basic words in Luya would be far more literate in Kakamega than Confucius, if you could bring him back to life. So, speaking of Chinese, though, there's, this, there's got to be a link to this video, too, as well. Uh, there's this thing that says Chinese language itself, the characters are apparently tautological and may lend themselves better to learning math. So now with that, I'm kind of wondering, is it, there's a general propensity for Asians to be better at math reliant fields. Is that part of why they developed a language that lends itself to math? Or was a language developed and then that kind of selected for the people who are better at speaking, communicating to each other, could get more resources. And since that happened to have some math aspects to it, it's selected for a population that had higher propensity or higher ability to deal with math it's kind of cool to kind of think of these things like which came before chicken before egg type thing so i think it'd be appropriate to say that a person is most literate for the given culture and location that they're in so this might also be the best way to look at rk strategy for example if you take the united states it's a welfare warfare state In the welfare state, there are R strategies and K strategies. The individuals in a group who uses welfare and apply a K strategy within that culture reproduce in different ways than people who use an R strategy. Somebody applying a K strategy and using direct welfare may more successfully pass on their personal ideas and culture and values to their children than somebody who has opted to use no welfare yet is still highly focused on the R strategy, where they're not focusing that much on investment in their children. So just an example of that is somebody who may be getting the direct welfare, this is getting food stamps, getting the things that are more directly considered direct welfare, direct transfers transfers of wealth from one person, as in you're you're getting this money to directly spend on X basic needs they may take that and they may also stay at home more, be more concerned with what their kid is doing in school, be more concerned with being there for dinner, be more concerned with just spending time with their kids and knowing their kids, trying to find out what's what's happening with their kid's life, what's happening to the day-to-day, how they're growing, and try to say, these are the things I value, try to let them understand where that welfare is coming from, what that process means, 
And you find in situations where people from these groups that have these kind of parents, two-parent households in most cases, um, strong families, strong relationships to a clan or a, just a familial environment, they have more of an attachment, I think a pride or a cohesiveness to the culture that they're in. They, I think, are more effective in that culture that they're in. You still see this happening. Yet you see people who who are at these protests and these anti-civilizational movements, these Antifa type things, no matter what political spectrum it is, whether it's like the extreme right or extreme left, you see people who don't really come from families that are that close. These people at these Antifa things, these, these anti-Trump protesters, these Occupy Wall Street protesters, they're not getting the direct welfare. They're not from families that were on food stamps and things like this in general, but they may have spent more indirect welfare, which is indirect social programs with things like public schooling, getting financial aid for further indoctrination in universities, and just being more reliant on the state in that way. And then I think you see that with them being more, they seem to be anti-civilization, but they also are for state growth. So anyway, uh, just winding this down now, that's my thoughts on this. RK strategy, it can apply just to humans. Yes, of course, if you put humans compared to all other living creatures, and yes, humans are K, just across the board. But then within those groups, there is also ways to talk about RK strategy. Do these certain group of people have a better reproductive strategy in because that's what it is it's a reproductive strategy so there's ways to say what is the most effective way to reproduce and not just reproduce in just passing on half your genetic material to a child but what's that child going to be like how successful is that child going to be because if you just have a kid and that kid dies a day later for example if you have somebody who's had 20 kids but due to the decisions they've made, those kids die a day after they've had, and then one person has one kid, and that kid lives to be 100, and then has two other kids, and then those two kids have two other kids, that person is more successful, I would say. That person with the one kid is more R. And now speaking of that, what would you say about the cultures or people or races or whichever groupings that you want to have that get in a situation where, yes, I do get this a welfare state, I do get this whole situation, and this goes back to that white genocide video that I made. If you have certain societies and you say, white people are more K than black people, but then you look and you say, oh, but black people are having more kids. Yes, they may be having more kids outside of wedlock, but you have places where white populations are supposedly dropping. You have places like Japan where people are completely worried, and again, I'm not worried about Japan, those guys are going to be okay. But they have a really, their population is crashing. They're, at, they're not at replacement levels of population. So if you say the Asians are more K, then they're not having kids. So essentially, if you don't have children, are you K? Is somebody like Nikolai Tesla K, even though he never had kids? And that's a good question. And I, I think probably not. Since it's an RK reproductive strategy. But then also, as I said, Humans, I think, are more than just our physical cells. We can pass on our culture, ideas, and things like that without necessarily physically reproducing. So what do you guys think? Do you think you can be K and not reproduce? Can they be K strategies that involve not reproducing? Because even if you look at the wolf, which is considered to be the most typical um, example of a K strategy, K strategic animal, most of the wolves don't reproduce. But yeah, let me know what you guys think. Thanks for watching the video. And uh, till next video, like, share, and subscribe. Mm, this was silence. And uh, yeah, check out those videos on, um, on Kraut and T's video and let me know what you think about that too. And yeah, till next video, goodbye.